Everyone, like I said last time, we need to find a method to use that flexure formula when we have multiple materials because it's only good for homogeneous beams. So like, where would you see this? Well, we might say wood beams that have reinforced steel plates or concrete beams have steel plates or you know steel um, rebar inside of them. So our flexure formula only works for homogeneous beams or ones that have a constant modular elasticity. That's not the case, we're out of luck. So what we're going to do is we're not gonna get rid of our flexure formula. We're going to develop a new method to take a beam that is not homogeneous and turn it into an equivalent beam that is homogeneous. So let's jump right into that. Okay, so for this, we're gonna be looking at, you know, something like this. We have a nice aluminum beam with lasting modules of 8 gigapascals. It's got an internal bending moment of 140 kilonewton millimeters. Now from this, we can calculate the radius of curvature if we want to for this very simple one. So we plug all this in and we'll get the radius of curvature is 40,000 millimeters. So you can see that even when we're saying it's bending, it's not much, that's, that's really, really small. <laughs> okay, so using this, we could then calculate the maximum bending strain. Notice I said strain, not stresses, strain. So if we do that using our rates of curvature, we'll find that the maximum bending strain is gonna be either plus or minus 0 0.0005 millimeters per millimeter. Okay, now this is important. This is important because it's one of the things that we have to keep constant for an equivalent beam. So for an equivalent beam to be, for two beams to be equivalent, they have to have the same rates of curvature and the same distribution and magnitude of strains. So if we're looking at it right here, okay, moment of inertia for the wood, that'd be 560,000 millimeters. We're kind of reversing it here. Rays of curvature has to stay constant. Module elasticity we take from wood. Moment is given to us earlier. And so if we look at it and we have to then calculate, well, because our rays of curvature is the same, because our distribution of strains has to be the same, it means that these will not have the same exact shape. They will, however, have the same exact height, because if you were to change the height, then the distribution of strains would be different. So what can change? Well, if the height has to stay the same, and we're able to already know what the moment of inertia for this piece has to be to have the same strain, radius of curvature, and the only thing that can change is the width. So we'll go from a very, very thin aluminum bar to a very thick um, wood bar. So I mean, that it would have to be 105 millimeters wide instead of 15 millimeters wide. Okay, so we've gotten a little bit of an idea of what it means to be equivalent. Same rays of curvature, which means that it's going to have the same distribution of strains. And we get that by making it either thinner or fatter. We don't change the height. Now, another thing we might be wondering is, do those equivalent beams have the same stresses? They have the same strains, why not the same stresses? Well, what do you think? The answer is no, no, they don't. And the reason for that is pretty simple. If the strains are the same, but the module's elasticity is not, well, then your stress can't be the same because we have two different materials here. Stresses aren't going to be the same. So the stress for the aluminum, now notice down here, it's moment of inertia, 35 megapascals. For wood, different moment of inertia, but everything else is the same and it has a much lower stress. Much lower stress because it has a much higher moment of inertia. You're like, okay, so stresses don't have to be the same, then how is this equivalent? Because isn't it supposed to be all connected? You're right, and we're gonna get there because you're gonna use your flexure formula to calculate stresses, and then you're gonna to have to translate it back into its original, um, into its original state. 
this is just connecting it again, which I've already done for you. Now, what we see here is that using what we found earlier, we can connect the modulus elasticity for our new materials and our old material to the width of my new material over my old material. This is something that's known as the modular ratio n. This is important. This is how we're going to translate it back. Because like you saw before, this is a different stress, but we need to then translate that into an equivalent stress for aluminum. Which what you'll see here is that this is seven times more than this. And guess what? 560 over 80. What do you think it equals? Seven. I think we might be getting to that module ratio is going to get like a multiple. We're going to multiply it to correct our stresses back to their original values. So we can then relate the difference in the stresses to this ratio. So we have our aluminum stress and the stress for wood. It's going to be equal to the modular elasticity of aluminum over the modular elasticity of wood, which will be equal to our modular ratio. Okay, so we're going to run through this last little step and see how everything works out. So using this method, we can then take a beam of multiple materials and convert it into a beam of a single material. Okay, a single material. And you can do it either way. I could have made this bottom beam very, very thin by turning it into wood. Just either way would work. And after using it, we then can calculate our stresses using our flexor formula. So for the regular section, we're gonna have our internal bending moment times the distance from the centroid over this. And in our second section, it's gonna be the modular ratio times the bending moment times the distance from the centroid over this. And what is this? That's the moment of inertia for the transformed section. Okay, transformed section. And please do not forget that in this transformed section, you have to make sure that you transform the stresses back. You will always see this kind of discontinuity here where it suddenly jumps, okay? Where it suddenly jumps. Okay, so we're gonna stop there right now. Um, moment inertia for the transform section, it's in your book if you wanna find the derivation for that. So you can go ahead and look, um, but it's not too difficult. We more or less did that already. So thank you for listening. And next time we're gonna jump into what you do if you have an eccentric beam, a beam that's not nice and straight. So I hope this helps you. I'll see you all next time.